see. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Emerging Revolutionary War, Rev War Revelry. We're coming with you with uh, esteemed historian Alex Keane. Um, he has put, once again, putting his reputation on the line with hanging out with us, Emerging Revolutionary War folks. Uh, he is, uh, let, let's see if I pronounce this right, a Juris Doctor uh, he is, uh, from Merrimack College. He's the author of We Stood Our Ground, and he will actually be joining us in October um, as Lexington Guide for the first uh, that Saturday morning tour of the uh, the road Lexington Concord in the beginning of the American Revolution, which is our tour uh, this year in October. We still have two tickets left on the bus, so if you want to join Alex in October over Columbus Day, our Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, please I'll go over to emergingrevolutionaryward.org. But with that... Um, Thank you, Alex, for joining us. And I think I covered the highlights of your bio, but if there's any specifics, uh, feel free to fill the holes in. Thank you. One thing I'll just add is I am also the uh, owner and uh, I call myself head nerd of uh, Historical Nerdery, uh, which is a uh, Revolutionary War blog uh, that focuses on the battles of Lexington and Concord and the events leading up uh, to the outbreak of the American Revolution in uh, Massachusetts. Perfect. And the uh, click on that uh, to find his blog. We'll actually link it in with the blog post about this revelry. So just click on over there and it'll just take you over to Alex's work and you can fill in, do all your research prior to uh, the tour in October. That way you can try to stump the uh, the historic nerd nerdery uh, that is up there. <laughs> but um, well, thank you. Yeah, now and um, so let's just get started uh, as we build up. Um, let's what's the road to Lexington? Uh, we do know. Paul Revere takes it on the night of April 18th, but stuff happens before then, correct? Correct. Uh, Lex Lexington's a really unique town when you take a look at some of the, the surrounding communities in the Massachusetts communities. Uh, when you take a look at Concord, when you take a look at Newburyport and, and, and say Andover, Massachusetts, they're fairly middle of the road by the middle of the 1760s. Where Lexington, um, by about 1767, is now on the pathway towards radicalism. Uh, they are at the forefront uh, of the uh, community uh, calling for uh, resistance against the crown uh, based upon crown policies. Uh, and they were openly um, uh, protesting uh, against these policies. They ranged from basically uh, uh, religious sermons under the Reverend Jonas Clark, uh, all the way up to uh, boycotts to uh, spinning bee protests uh, to actually outright by 17. The eight uh, advocating for armed resistance against crown policy, and so it's really fueled. Um, to mention Jonas Clark, obviously, um, a now it was he a break in the um kind of the movement toward um revolution, or is he kind of just the one that's symbolic of a lot of these preachers in in the Massachusetts countryside? You know, the the, the there was definitely uh, a lot of complaints from the. Uh, Crown forces uh, leading up to Lexington and Concord about how influential uh, the Congregationalist Ministry of New England was in, in preaching sedition from the pulpit. Uh, and of the ministers, probably the one who was one of the most influential during this time is the Reverend Jonas Clark. Uh, Jonas Clark, as early as 1768, is preaching in Lexington and throughout eastern Massachusetts the need to prepare for war and how it was duty of, of Christians to resist crown policy. Uh, he started off probably around the Stamp Act. He was predominantly preaching to Lexington. By about 1768 to 1770, he is a featured guest uh, lecturer throughout uh, eastern Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. Uh, where he's preaching from the pulpit the, these uh, ideas. Uh, he was also a linchpin in Lexington politics. Um, if you take a look at the Lexington Committee of Correspondence during this time, where I allude to the radicalism and how they are outright uh, invoking English liberties and following any uh, legal methods, including what they saw as armed resistance against crown policy, it's the Reverend Clark that's actually drafting uh, these uh these letters from the Lexington Committee of uh, Correspondence. So he was a key influential figure as early as about, as I say, about 1767, 1768. He has persuaded the minds of, of his flock uh, in Lexington, and he's already spreading out uh, through Massachusetts, Eastern Massachusetts, uh, spreading the word that way as well. So uh, with that, how does he connect with like John Hancock and um, Sam Adams? I mean, there's a reason. They're, they show up at his place. It's not like there's a yeah. the hotel's full. In Lexington it, it, that it, night. It's, 
it's a twofold approach, uh, Phil. The first thing is, uh, the Clark's predecessor was, was the Reverend Hancock, uh, Reverend Hancock, who was John Hancock's uh, cousin. Uh, so there's already a familiar relationship uh, in Lexington with the Hancock family. Uh, on top of that, um, Hancock's fiance uh, had relatives who resided in Lexington as well. Uh, so she was often coming over there. But it comes down to Hancock's political role uh, during this time. Uh, Hancock and Sam Adams often sought him out uh, for guidance. Uh, he was uh, having often having these two as honored guests uh, at his parsonage in Lexington. So on April 18, 1775, uh, both Sam Adams and John Hancock were in Lexington. Uh, the reason they were is because the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, uh, which is the rebel government at this time, is meeting in Concord. And Hancock actually invited the two men to come back and stay as his guest at their parsonage. Uh, while there, uh, Hancock's fiance um, was also present, uh, as well as uh, their um, uh, their personal aide, uh, John Lowell. Uh, so Hancock had, uh, excuse me, Clark had a very strong relationship with both of these men. Uh, and it wasn't uncommon to see them from time to time in Lexington. So they're... So they would have bounced back and forth, is what you're saying. The Hancock yes. going, yeah. So it was, and so um, Clark is preaching this. You have this uh, break. Um, uh, this might be a question you may not be able to answer, but so why does the action start at Lexington and not anywhere else? Why is that the first shot? I, I've done some research about this, and I've blogged it a couple of times. I, I think it, it's it's a couple of factors. Um, the, the first thing is, uh, you know, it, it could have happened in Salem. There was there was an incident in February of 1775 where British forces marched to Salem. I, I take that back. They landed in Marblehead by way of water, then marched to Salem uh, in an effort to see some brass cannons there. They were unsuccessful. Uh, there were other marches into the countryside that the British did from time to time. What that did, though, is it set up precedent for the Lexington militia commander, John Parker, uh, John Parker uh, had the precedence of the uh, Salem affair. And he also had incidents where there were reports where British would go out, march out into the countryside, mostly just to exercise. But usually once these British regiments or these battalions would go out exercising in the countryside, as soon as they saw a militia company on a hill or down the road conducting observation of them, they would usually turn around and head back. So I think Parker's mindset at that particular time was that uh, he had precedent. He he honestly thought that, hey, this is what happened in Salem. This is what's been happening in the Middlesex countryside or the Suffolk County uh, countryside. If they see us displayed on the green, um, perhaps they'll turn around. And, and the interesting thing about that is prior to them deciding to stay where they were, uh, they had almost like a mini town meeting within the militia company. And of course, who's present? The Reverend Clark. Uh, and Reverend Clark is, and they went back and forth and there was a serious debate based upon what the Reverend Clark said a year later. They were actually debating about marching probably back towards Bedford, stay out of view, maybe perhaps march on to Concord to join the Concord uh, units there. But they ultimately made the decision to stay where they were, I think partially because of precedent to possibly turn the, the, the British around. They also had, I think, probably a defense mechanism as well. They wanted to make sure that, you know, the British weren't going to stop us start ransacking their property also. That's why. So they're lined up. So who is this John Parker? We always hear, like, the myths, but he's a major influence, obviously, being in charge of the militia, but he actually is got some military background, correct? Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> the, the, the idea that, you know, it, it started off in the 1890s when John Parker's great granddaughter at a presentation to the Lexington, Lexington Historical Society said, um, you know, he was a French, French and Indian War veteran. He served with Rogers Rangers. By the time you get to David Hackett Fisher writing about Paul Revere's ride, it's been expanded that he served in the 1740s at the Siege of Lewisburg. And then uh, he served as part of Rogers Rangers during the French and Indian War, and even there's hints that he was part of Pontiac's rebellion afterwards. Unfortunately, there's no evidence of that. Um, I have actually reviewed the documentation from the town at that time. He's he's in Lexington throughout the 1740s and 1750s when people thought he might be at Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, he was actually in Lexington with his wife as the wife was delivering one of their children uh, when they thought he might have been at the Plains of Abraham in Quebec. He's in Lexington receiving a bayonet that had been issued from the uh, colony. 
Uh, so he had no prior military experience in the sense of, hey, he served in the French wars. But what he did was, is he did rise up through the ranks of Lexington's militia company. And there is evidence um, by about 1762, 1763, where he is a corporal of, of the Lexington training band, the official name for the militia, that he was teaching himself the drills of the time. Um, so it, I have seen documentation that he was teaching himself what was called Bland's drill, uh, which was the official drill of the colony at that time. It's very slow, methodical drill. Um, by the time of the eve of the Battle of Lexington, uh, he has been elected as the captain of the militia company. Um, he was playing a prominent role. He's starting to come of age within town. He's he's in his mid-40s. Uh, he's starting to take on more political roles within the town. Uh, and he was elected the town's captain uh, of the militia. And on top of that, he was responsible for um, putting together an artillery piece uh, for the company as well. They actually, the town got to get some funds and purchased a cannon, and he was leading the committee to acquire that cannon. Uh, so he is starting to come of his own. The, the unfortunate thing is, on the eve of Lexington, uh, the Battle of Lexington, he's also suffering from tuberculosis. Uh, so he's dealing with health issues as well. So he's, what you're saying is he's a smart guy because he's not in Lewisburg because he's home with his wife when she's giving birth. So that's what yeah, keeps him. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, he, he may have stayed in Lewisburg, right? Uh, he's, that was the case. He's, he's trying to keep his wife happy, so he's staying behind, yes. And, and so he rises up, um, and for those not familiar, our, the Lexington does not acquire a brass cannon, though, correct? Or did he have one they, just not there? They, did it, they didn't get a brass cannon. They got their hands in an old naval gun, which was an iron gun. From what... I've seen from the research, both done by John Bell, as well as Joel Bowie, part of my French, the gun was a piece of crap. Uh, we weren't sure if it was really functional. They had to build a carriage. And then the gun kind of disappears until after the American Revolution, when it resurfaces as part of a brand new artillery company that's formed in Lexington. So I, I honestly think the gun was was a piece of junk. Uh, and I think, and they purchased it from the, from Watertown, Massachusetts. And I'm beginning to suspect that Watertown may have ripped them off. Well, you wouldn't say one Massachusetts town ripping off another one, would you? That sounds, <laughs> that sounds kosher. Um, but let's think about one of, one of the things that's always impressed me with um, uh, John Par or Captain Parker is that first the alarm comes out very early, like overnight, early in the morning, and the men disperse. Then he brings them back, of course, with the, the shot, not the shot heard around the world, the pre-shot heard around the world. And then he's even got him a third time later on the hillside. So John Parker must be one of these very respected uh, individuals. He was. It? And this is what's truly amazing about John Parker. It's not that he the myth of a French and Indian War fighter or anything like that. He, he, he was a, he was a natural born leader. Uh, you know, it, the amazing thing is his militia company was literally at the Battle of Lexington swept off the field. Uh, you had uh, eight dead, 10 wounded, just wiped off the field. Uh, they could have simply hung up their hat that day and said, listen, we're going to sit out the rest of the day uh, and we're, we're done. Uh, and I don't think anybody would have questioned them for doing that based upon the aftermath of the Battle of Lexington. What he did, however, with the assistance of Reverend Clark, but this is on Parker, he was able to rally his men, convince them to, hey, we are going to go back into war and we are going to meet head on the British unit uh, or units that swept us from the field. And we're, we're going to we're going to hit them hard. And his men were behind him. Um, it, it's just an ama amazing testament of leadership. And, and the neat thing that I have found uh, that Minuteman National Park has reported to me is the U.S. Army to this day uses his rallying of an effective leadership command as one of their case studies in their staff ride of Lexington and Concord. Right. I think that's one of the undertold stories of like the personal heroism, but also, I mean, we forget that these men are literally, been, like you said, wiped off the field in front of their home homes. Um, and I mean, one and not only that, they're able to come back. But yeah, Parker uh, is just in one of his amazing untold. Um, I mean, heroes. Unfortunately, he is dying of tuberculosis, so he doesn't play a major role. And we can get right. into the what if if you like, but uh, yeah, um, but it is one of those guys that. Um, yeah. Does he say anything close to what he is reported as saying? You know, the interesting thing is um, th th there's two accounts. You you have his deposition from about a week after the Battle of Lexington and Concord. 
And you have to keep in mind that that a lot of the depositions were propaganda pieces at that time. So they were carefully worded uh, and they were carefully chosen before they were sent over to England to rally the public cause uh, behind armed resistance by Massachusetts. In that deposition, he basically asserts, hey, we were lawfully ascended, assembled for an alarm. We received word that the British had mobilized and they were coming out into the countryside. And as a result, uh, you know, I had my men assembled. Uh, however, he says also, as soon as I saw uh, British taking the field, I ordered them to withdraw and quit the field. Uh, at that point, by that deposition, that places him on the defensive. That basically argues that the British were completely in the wrong. You jump ahead to the 1820s, where suddenly, particularly around the time of Lafayette, which is, you know, I think, 200 years ago this year, he visited Lexington and Concord. And pretty much he makes this statement in Lexington when he's visiting the Green, basically saying the American Revolution began here. This is where the first shot was. Well, that just completely sets off Concord. And of course, now there's this big competition to this day. Where was the shot that started the American Revolution? Well, they went Lexington, the town of Lexington, to respond and say, yeah, the revolution started here. They went out and they gathered a bunch of depositions. And a common theme that we see is this deposition now that this Lexington is defiant on the green. And Parker allegedly said, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. He also allegedly told his militiamen, if ever you run, I'll shoot you myself. Um, you know, so you have these two extremes. I, I think Parker was probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, based upon the research that I've conducted, Joel Bowie's conducted, Minuteman National Park has conducted, uh, we've we found that the militia companies were not as ragtag as many previous beliefs were. A lot of people uh, have come to the conclusion based upon research that they were disciplined and they were drilling quite heavily. They had a structure of command. Uh, Massachusetts Provincial Congress had passed uh, basically military codes of justice about two weeks prior to the Battle of Lexington for the Massachusetts Grand Army. So I think Parker was somewhere in the middle. I think he was basically saying, you're not going to fire, but at the same time, we are going to maintain our position here uh, on or near the green a, a, as a unit of observation, hopefully to turn this militia, uh, this expedition around without a shot being fired. I don't mean, not like they can really even leave either. I mean, they are at Lexington Militia on Lexington Green. Um, yes. It, it, this is literally defending Roman Hearth if there is going to be an action. But just to show a force, like um, that has to play a role in it. it. It did. It really did. There's there's no way you could avoid it. You had multiple things adding to the tension. On Lexington side, you uh, had by about 11 p.m. on April 18th to about midnight. Of course, you had Revere arrive. You had William Dawes arrive. You also have this massive evacuation of the civilian populace. They're getting out of there because they do not want to be caught in the middle. So you have the Lexington men who are now afraid of what's happening to their loved ones who are hiding out in the woods and what's going to happen to the homes around the green. And at the same time, you have this British column that's trying to work its way towards Concord. It's just an unfortunate comedy of errors. One bad thing after the other is happening to this uh, column. There's uh, there's alarm riders that are reporting that their movements, there's alarm guns that are going off, alarm bells. Uh, they know by about two miles outside of Lexington, uh, common that, you know, the, the, the jig is up. The, the countryside knows they're out there. They know they're heading to Concord. And there's a report of a very large body of militia uh, on the Lexington Green in front of them. Um, the confusion is those could have been spectators that they were adding to the mix. Um, could have been, you know, Lexington militia. Uh, but it was really a heightened, heightened circumstance. And of course, as they are approaching the Green, there's at least one account of a what they believe was a Lexington militiaman who may have fired his musket at the uh, at the regulars, but the gun did not go off. It was what was called a flash in the pan. Uh, so it, there's just this heightened, heightened sense. And finally, Major Pitcairn, who's second in command of the entire expedition, orders the column to halt uh, and has them uh, load and fix bayonets. So that just... possible and as a result they're now much i think it was just a rest of disaster uh you know there was no there were issues of command control on top and there were issues of command control with lexington it was just a recipe waiting to happen for disaster i mean almost like the the perfect storm marching in uh but it is yes. a lot of those those myths um 
and everything. And honest, uh, excuse me, uh, folks, we are having a slight uh, electrical storm here. So if you see flashes, um, that's what's happening okay. here. Um, um, it's actually, yeah, um, it's one of those summer storms. But uh, okay. talking about it's cool. like the flashes, uh, yeah, that's happening overnight. It's the chaos. The weather is just uh, playing it here. But um, yeah. so as they move in, they'll, uh, for those who are uh, listening in, um, there is a difference between militia and Minutemen. There is some, uh, Lexington does not have Minutemen, correct? Concord, or Concord has, excuse me, let me say Concord. That's the right way to say it, yes. not Concord. Uh, Concord has it, but Concord. Lexington is just just militia, correct? That is correct. So Lexington, this is the, the weird thing. Uh, and, and I still curse the person who did this. At some point between the centen centennial celebration and World War II, somebody walked into Lexington Town Hall and asked to see the town records from uh, from April 1775. And they walked out with them never to return. So as a result, the town records from about January of 1775 to May of 1775 are gone. So you don't have any direct evidence of Minute Company. What I see, however, in the records is Lexington keeps refusing, referring to themselves as a militia company. Uh, they were officially known in town records as the Lexington Training Band. They nicknamed uh, or informally called themselves Captain John Parker's Lexington Company. So often they will, in their depositions and their accounts, refer to themselves as Captain John Parker's Lexington Company. There was a second company, and that was the alarm list. Uh, I've recently uncovered evidence uh, that Lexington had an alarm list, uh, as most towns did. That is your reserve of reserve forces. It's generally any individuals who are over 60 years of age. According to some accounts that I've, I've recently read, uh, at least when Parker assembled his company on around midnight of April 19th, elements of his militia company and elements of, his, of the town's alarm list fielded on the green together. Uh, but there were no Minutemen. Lexington never had, as far as I can see, Lexington never had uh, Minutemen. Uh, they weren't the only ones. Woburn didn't have a Minute Company. Uh, Cambridge didn't have a Minute Company. Um, but Conquer did, Lincoln did, uh, Danvers did. Um, Lexington never got around to it. That's done about Lincoln. That's the one town that gets ignored in all this, right? Uh, you have yeah. uh, Lexington, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know. Uh, well, like, so, Lincoln, unfortunately, is sometimes the redheaded stepchild. Well, they, they get the shaft, which is unfortunate because they, they contributed significantly to the day. I mean, maybe they're the end of the Lincoln end or uh, Lexington and Concord. Uh, but the so militia there, now are you a believer of the the shot might have come from Buckman's Tavern that started it all? Or is that one of those other myths that have made its way through? You know, it depends on who you ask. Um, you know, the 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 British accounts say it came from uh, either behind a fence or a stone wall near Buckman Tavern. Um, the Americans say that it was an officer on horseback who fired his pistol, uh, which would probably point at Major, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant Sutherland of the 38th Regiment of Foot. Um, you know, if you had to point to anybody on the British side, my suspicion is that if the shot came from the British side, it was probably Sutherland, just because he really protests too much in his own deposition of what happened that day. It's sort of like he's trying to make excuses for everything. But the, the British accounts say that it came near Buckman Tavern. Now, there is sort of local tradition that they believe it may have been um, Solomon Brown, uh, who was a 19-year-old uh, militiaman from Parker's company, that they believe that he may have hopped over a fence, took a pot shot at the, uh, the British column, and then went into Buckman and may have fired again. Uh, other than that, shot to this day is unknown. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, we, it's spec wildly speculated where the source came from. It's in his notes that walked out sometime between uh, the Centennial and World War One. It was like, I shot, shot, fired the first shot or something. Um, I just there can't probably get over is, There's probably a town meeting where they said, hey, you know, yeah. you fired the first shot. What were you thinking? Yeah. I, I mean, as a historian, as a person of injury with records, or just a uh, red-blooded American, like, can't believe it's gone. Just walk, like, walked out. Like, um, yeah, it's it's so frustrating. You know, trying to. It's been difficult where where I've researched town, other towns for their their activities of their militia and minute companies. I can walk right into the towns, look at the town records, and see. Okay, these are the arms that were issued. This is the equipment. This is what they're being paid for drilling. 
Lexington was a lot of, I had to look at other sources. I had to look at mass the provincial Congress records. Um, I had to look at later depositions. I, I had to look at the Massachusetts legislative records where people were submitting claims for equipment that was lost. It, it was a very difficult, it's still three years later, still ongoing process. Labor of love, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, I actually sorry, enjoy but, doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's any uh, tidbits. I mean, not the you would need to buy your book and, and all that, but any tidbits, you uh, strands you want to pull out as teasers of what you found as you piece this all together. I'll give you two teasers. Uh, the, the, the first teaser is the little known fact is uh, there were actually loyalists present at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Um, you know, it's 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 a whole different. I I just blogged about it uh, this past uh, some last night actually if I feel, about uh, some of their role, but uh, what, what is not known. Uh, is that there were loyalists um, uh, who were present during Lexington and Concord. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but uh, unless you ask follow-up questions, then I'll tell you. But the other thing which is really uh, interesting is the level of extent Captain John Parker's company went to prepare for war. Uh, the I, I'm in the process right now of examining roughly about 50 to 60 uh, town accounts of arms and equipment and drill schedules for uh, what the towns were doing. And Lexington ranks as one of the top five uh, in preparation for war. Uh, from what I've seen from the original records and some of the accounts, um, they were drilling hard. They were probably drilling every other day. Uh, and these guys, when they took the green that day, they were well equipped, uh, which again, adds to the tension when the British were approaching. And the British officers do mention in their accounts, these guys were armed and equipped for war. Uh, so it, it's neat to find that. We have this mythology there. These are just uh, pulled out of the uh, what farm fields and out of the taverns and so forth. But these, um, the training regiment uh, seems to be pretty strict, at least for the Lexington militia, knowing their arms and so forth. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's actually colony wide at this point, okay. and it depends on which uh, town you're looking at. You know, certain towns were drilling at least once a fortnight, which I think comes out to about twenty days. Other towns were drilling every day. And the really neat one, which doesn't have to do with Lexington, but is just fascinates me, is the uh, Merrimack Valley Minute Company. So that's basically from Andover all the way up to Salisbury Beach in, in the, the Merrimack Valley portion of Massachusetts. They were in there's roughly about six to eight minute companies within that battalion. They're being, they're being drilled and trained by a British deserter. Uh, so there's actually a British soldier who fled Boston, was hiding out in Haverhill. And began charging money and was making a living going around to these different towns, training them for war. We talk about payback um, one way or the other, yeah. but yeah. Uh, and, and that's what's, so you mentioned earlier, just, I think eight killed, 10 wounded or so. Give a number, like, is that 40% that are on the green, you think? 50%? What's the, the number? You know, if you had... it, it varies. You know, the, the early 19th century accounts I referenced, they put the Lexington Company as low of between 30 and 40 men. Uh, most of the contemporary accounts put it somewhere around 60 to 70 men. Uh, I, I I line up with those. I think it was something between 60 and 70. So I would say about half of the full militia company was there. Parker's company, including the alarm list of the elderly men, on paper had about 120 men, uh, about half of them mobilized uh, for uh, the Battle of Lexington. When Parker rallied them to go back into the fight, uh, my estimate, I believe they were probably closer to 100 men. They were almost at full company strength going back into the battle. Is that, so when the alarm, so backing up a little, so when the alarm goes out at night, there's yep. some that don't respond because they're too far away or is, or is just, the, uh, middle of the night. It, it was a couple of reasons. Exactly. That's exactly what's called. It was either they, they didn't respond because it was middle of the night. They were asleep. Uh, I do have some accounts of they may have been tell, tending to a sick wife, an elderly parent, where they just couldn't get to the alarm. Um, or they, 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 they were elsewhere. <laughs> there were some militia men who were off canoodling with their, their girlfriends or they were off doing something else that they hadn't returned home yet. Uh, and of course, this is a Tuesday night going into a Wednesday. Uh, so most of them were preparing. I'm, I'm getting up the next May to, next morning to tend to my fields. And so a good chunk of them are in bed. Imagine coming home and be like, uh oh, I missed the call to start yeah. to start a war. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. whoops, um, or advantageous. Um, 
One of the questions, this is always uh, interesting to me, is uh, we talked about alluded a little bit already, but of course the fighting happens in the morning, then uh, Smith's men go all the way out to, to Concord and, and then start coming back. Um, what is it like in the town of Lexington between those two points? I mean, you said the civilian population is kind of gone, so is it chaos? Is it like the quiet eye of the hurricane? It, it's it's absolute chaos. Uh, you know, the, the, the sad thing is those family members, and, and I, I do have to give my editorial comment real quickly. The, the women who, who rose up, you know, before the Lexington and uh, Battle of Lexington, the things they did, you know, it was a story onto themselves. There, there's accounts of, uh, I have one account of a woman who gathered all the, basically the neighborhood kids and, and led them to safety. Uh, she was like barely a 25 year old mother. She's gathering all the children in the neighborhood to bring them to safety. There's other accounts uh, of women who were carrying the elderly in chairs to bring them to, to, to various farms out of harm's way, carrying uh, pregnant women and women who had just given birth. So all this was going on. The tragic thing is they could hear the Battle of Lexington. Uh, from their points of safety, because basically eastern Massachusetts is deforested, so sound is going to travel. So they return back to the green pretty quickly after the battle. And of course, they see their, their fathers, husbands, brothers, uh, neighbors, all you know, dead and wounded. There's an absolute chaos at this particular point. What are we going to do? And, and this again comes where where Clark is rallying the militia. Uh, excuse me, where Parker is rallying the militia. Clark is trying to tend to his flock. And what he did was he he the, he was able to get the community rallied so that they actually had a funeral service for the uh, for the eight that were killed. Okay, uh, there are accounts that they were able to put together hastily uh, some pine boxes. Uh, they were buried uh, in pine boxes. They had a service in the town meeting house, which is an 18th century version of a Congregationalist church, and then they buried the bodies in a brush heap. Uh, just to hide them because they were absolutely fearful that the British were going to desecrate the graves if they put them in their regular graves on the way back. Well, now everyone in town suddenly realizes the British are going to come back. They're starting to get worse that there's been a battle in Concord and the British are now getting ready to retreat. There's absolutely sheer panic. Uh, according to the Reverend William Gordon, who interviewed people from Lexington about two weeks after the battle, the roads are absolutely clogged with women and children weeping and crying. Uh, because they're fearful that the British are going to come back and this is absolute terror. Uh, there's accounts from other women who say that, you know, they tried to stay, they were staying in their house as long as they could, but then suddenly they're seeing off in the distance um, British approaching. They're fleeing their homes uh, and just the accounts of mass panic fleeing across farm fields to get out of the way. Uh, there's accounts of men who couldn't fight in the battle. Uh, there's a couple who might have been ill. There is one humorous account of, of a militiaman who was forced to watch the fighting from a hill because his younger brother stole his musket, cartridge box, bayonet, and knapsack to go fight. So he's kind of furious that he's sitting on the sidelines. But there's this absolute panic that's taking place from about, I'd say, about 8 in the morning all the way up until the time Parker leaves, some point around maybe 11 or 12. Uh, and I would say by the time Parker left, uh, and they, they managed, Lexington's a ghost town by about 1 p.m. It's just everyone is out of there, and they're hiding, and they're fearful. I mean, are, where, I mean, where do they go? Like, are they heading north? I mean, they're not going to go east into Boston. They can't go west. They're just so, so my or... is, it, it, it's interesting. We, it, and it wasn't just Lexington. There was this mass panic and civilian evacuation that, um, took, that basically – some people went really way out of the way. Like they would, like I have accounts for people from Cambridge who fled all the way up to Andover, Massachusetts and stayed there. But what I see for Lexington residents, they went to three directions. They kind of went, you know, Southeast, you know, they started towards Boston, but they took a left turn. Um, that might be, yeah, Southeast. Uh, they, they went towards Woburn. Uh, there's a section of Woburn that was called Scotland. Excuse me, there was a section of Lexington that was called Scotland along the Woburn line. And that was probably composed of mostly Scotlands who, who arrived there uh, in the 1740s. There's accounts of Lexington uh, women and children and elderly men who are fleeing towards Bedford, a uh, an area called Smock Farm, which I'm trying to identify the exact location. Uh, there's accounts of uh, of uh, Lexington uh, people fleeing towards uh, Waltham uh, and, and hiding in swamps. So basically, they're going, they're avoiding two directions. They're avoiding heading towards Concord because that's where the column is coming back from. 
And they're trying to avoid um, coming from Boston uh, just simply because, you know, there's going to be forces coming out that way and British and American forces are trying to converge on the column. Um, and of course, add to the mix as they're trying to flee to safety, you have multiple units coming through Lexington, militia and minute companies from all over eastern Massachusetts trying to get to uh, the retreating British column. And so it's just a mess of, of clogged roads trying to get out of the way, heightened tensions, great emotion. Um, and it's sad because a lot of the Lexington uh, civilian population, even when they were safe away, they could still see their homes burning. They could see, you know, they could hear the gunshots, the artillery blasts. It was really a traumatic event. But I will give you one woman uh, real quickly who there, there are a few women who stayed near their properties. And the one who I, I, I do really say she's probably the toughest of all the Lexington women. And that was Anna Monroe. Anna Monroe stayed with um, her property, Monroe Tavern, uh, which is owned by the Lexington Historical Society, to the very end. Uh, she ended up fleeing uh, her tavern, as she's saying, Percy's relief column is now deploying artillery pieces and firing on the retreating British column. And her five-year-old daughter will re later recall in the 19th century, I remember running next to my mother as we're fleeing and the artillery guns are going over our head. I mean, well, I think that, you know, it seems like the most obvious fact that like, hey, these it is a confusion, like you're saying, chaos. What what ha I mean, it's upsetting the whole population. Um, and and we kind of missed that because like we could, I don't want to say glorify, but like you paint over, oh, it's the shot heard around the world, this thing. Yep. But I mean, it's really the. I mean, it's their D Day. I mean, it's. It, it, it really I is. I, I agree. And, and, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years, you know, a, a lot of the books that were written, of course, is taking snapshots at, at different phases of the day. It was a bloody, brutal, chaotic mess. And, and I think what sort of minimized that, and I don't mean to make fun of them or give them a hard time, but it's the 19th century historians. They tended to give you a watered down slash glorified ver local history version uh, and, and a lot of good came out of their research, but it was this watered down, glorified approach that minimized it. And I think their rationale was a lot of them wrote their histories in the in the shadows of the American Civil War. And it's really tough reading about, you know, the Battle of Lexington, which was just a slaughter, the monotony fight, which I, I, I compare it to Black Hawk Down. I mean, the monotony fight was a, a door to door, hand to hand fight, you know, for five to six miles. Uh, so things like that, yeah, it, it does get watered down, but you have hit it right on. It was, the day was nothing but chaos. And I mean, it's it's amazing, too, that the day after, on April 20th, when Warren starts to get these primary sources, like, it almost has a modern twist to it. Uh, like, hey, can you recapture what you're, what you're hearing and saying? And I think we take for granted, oh, this helps the get the American message to the, what, the Cairo, to London, and all that. But it's asking these people to relive an experience 24, 48 hours after. Maybe. It's it's tough. And, and you know, there's 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 one account, the Reverend David McClure. Uh the Reverend David McClure, I believe he uh, forgetting what town he was from. I want to say he was either from Boston or Cambridge, but I or he might have been from Roxbury. He was from Boston proper. He went out and toured the battlefield uh afterwards, the day after. And his account, he he's just absolutely horrified. He he, he said He's seen um, just absolute devastation of property. Uh, he's seeing um, um, farm animals and horses dead everywhere. Then he starts coming across the bodies. He says, just for miles, he said, it's for, he said the damage was over 20 miles, just this amount of destruction. And the saddest account uh, was a, a couple who had fled, and I'm drawing a blank on their names right now, but they had fled from Cambridge and ended up being in, in Andover. When they returned, they encountered uh, a father who had returned the next day with a car to bring his son home, you know, so they could bury him. Uh, and, and this is what you're seeing throughout Lexington. Lexington had the hardest hit. Not only did they have um, the, the Battle of Lexington, which resulted in personal loss of life, the height of the British retreat back, back to Boston, Percy arrives in Lexington uh, to basically rescue Smith's column. And he has those artillery pieces I was referring to. He had two cannons. Well, they've opened fire on the uh, American forces as they're trying to close in on Smith's column. And one of the artillery balls goes right through the town meeting house. Town meeting house um, is considered the 18th century church. of the And then uh, 
Percy realizes also that before we retreat, you know, we're going to be having a lot of houses starting to close on the road, which are going to give great sniper positions for the Massachusetts forces. He orders all the homes in Lexington along that road from Monroe Tavern all the way to the Cambridge line to be burnt. Uh, so when you look at Doolittle's uh, print, plate four, where it shows Eastern Lexington being burned, that's just the height of it as well. And arson in the 18th century was considered a capital crime. It was on par with murder. Uh, so at this point, Lexington has had personal uh, property destruction, loss of life, financial ruin. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, they never recovered from it. Uh, by 17, by the end of the uh, of the American Revolution, almost half of Lexington men uh, are in debt and are facing foreclosure because of the destruction of the American Revolution. So that's why it's important to come hear their stories uh, and and step on yep. the ground. So uh, as we go into the last quarter hour, I mean, the only problem with these historian happy hours that we do is that you kind of go down and then when you get started with these cool stories or the history, you realize that, hey, you're coming in in the last 15 minutes. So, um, but don't sweat if you're enjoying what Alex is saying. Uh, you're going to have a whole morning with them in October. Um, if you haven't bought your tickets, we got two left as of this recording. So uh, grab those last two seats. But uh, so as we transition, how'd you get interested in, in Lexington? Why, uh, why are you joining us in October? Uh, you, you, you know, it, 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 it's really funny. This goes way, way, way back to the Bicentennial. Uh, Bicentennial, I might have been five or six years old. Um, you know, I remember we took a trip to, um, class trip to the Bunker Hill Pavilion, which is now closed. And I remember buying a toy musket. And I remember that that weekend tending, I was at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And I always just had this fascination with the American Revolution. Jump forward after I graduated from high school, um, I wanted to get into Civil War reenacting, but I couldn't find a Civil War group in, in my area. Uh, I, I grew up in northern Massachusetts. You'd think they would have them, but they didn't. And so one of my neighbors said, well, there's this group called the Lexington Minutemen. You should check them out. They do the Battle of Lexington. Well, around this time where I'm looking for a group, there's a, a Hallmark movie that came out called April Morning. Uh, so that just reignited my interest tenfold. So I ended up joining uh, the Lexington Minutemen. And by the time I was uh, probably about a senior at Merrimack College, I, I started to realize, like, wow, this is a really neat story. But the story we're presenting is is not right. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that does a disservice to Lexington. There's a lot of stuff that we're missing. What can we do? And, and to their credit, the Lexington Minutemen and Lexington Historical Society said, go for it. Start researching it. And that just launched it. And uh, I, I really probably by about 2010, historical nerdery is up and running and, you know, it just became my passion to stay, eat, sleep and breathe Battle of Lexington. And we're very uh, thankful that you are. I mean, the book is, is amazing. I wanna, if I remember it, I'll bring a copy of my copy for you to sign it. Absolutely. Um, but uh, and if you haven't got it, please uh, yeah, go out to, to purchase Alex's book. And on that vein, um, what is new? What's new research? Um, obviously, there's something called America's 250th coming up. I think there's going to be events. Um, what, there there you... is. Uh, I, I, I'm i toying with it. I think I'm, I'm probably, uh, it's funny because I think I decided it today. I, I think I'm going to be coming out with my fourth edition of the Battle of Lexington book, uh, We Stood Our Ground. Uh, I've just started toying with it. There's even more research that's coming out. A lot of uh, data that I found on the peoples of Lexington that I want to include. Um, I, I think the next step is, is probably for me is going to be looking at Lexington during the Siege of Boston. They were heavily involved in, in activities of Siege of Boston and uh, just get, taking a deep, deep dive, a further dive into uh, the, the build up to war. Uh, it, it, I'm just absolutely amazed how well prepared, even though they, they were on the losing end of the Battle of Lexington, the fact that they reentered that battle so quickly goes to their training and to their leadership. I think I'd be taking a deeper dive into the militia system and see, you know, what motivated them and, and what their training was to get ready. So those are a couple of projects on the horizon. That's what's kind of the fascinating when we were up, um, uh, Rob and I were uh, researching just the preliminary book to try to get people to engage and then uh, deep dive like you did. Um, we were amazed that even like they were re examined where Parker's, where Bluff was or Parker, the, the massacre site where they moved that. Um, yeah, what a kind of people we're going to show people that in October. But if you want to give them a little insight on, on what you think about the archaeology there yeah. and so forth, that that was that is definitely worth its time seeing. It, it was for years we were decades we we thought it was spot A. There's this rock 
outcropping, you know, that they thought that Parker's company was up there and was hitting, uh, hit the retiring British colonists. Rallied his troops, brought him back into the battlefield and hit him at this site. Well, about seven or eight years ago, Minuteman National Park sponsored an archaeological dig and they found out that Parker specifically chose this point for its tactical advantages. There was a stream there with a bridge they had to cross. So it was almost like Merriam's Corner from earlier in the day where all the British forces had to converge in to cross this, this stream because it was too deep to cross by you know jumping over it. And Parker's company was waiting there for them and hit them with a, a full broadside of a volley. Uh, and, and it swept across it, and the British were hit hard. Uh, Colonel Smith, commander of the forces, was knocked off his horse. His horse had been shot. Uh, and Parker probably got a few more shots off, and then they, they, they hightailed it out of there, swung around to the bluff, and uh, hit him again uh, in the bluff. Uh, so Parker's revenge is definitely worth it. It's, and when you see it, it's going to make sense why he particularly picked that spot. Uh, it just it undertells the story of why there needs to continue to be research, the deeper dives. Um, yep. As long as you don't walk out of Lexington Historical Society with the documents, you should be good, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> and if you have the documents, I'll look the other way if you return. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's somebody, that'd be amazing if they're in some attic or something uh, this day, but um, yeah. unfortunately, they're probably lost uh, history. Well, um, as we um, kind of gear now and down toward the end, I uh, just wanted to provide any Last few minutes, anything you want to discuss that was on the top of your head or uh, prelude to October or something you know, coming I, up in I, the near future? I would say definitely, you know, you referenced the 250th activities. Um, I, I believe actually the weekend you will be there. I believe Minuteman National Park may be kicking off some of their 250th activities. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, just, uh, you know, I, I would say... You know, take a look at the Journal of the American Revolution. Take a look at your website. Uh, you're welcome to visit my website, historicalnerdery.com. You'll find a lot of resources lead, you know, on Lexington and Concord. Just have some fun. That's what I would say. When you get down to the site in October, just have some fun and enjoy it because uh, Lexington Green, uh, as well as Minuteman National Park and Concord Bridge, they are all just simply beautiful, amazing places to visit. So they are, and uh, we're excited to yeah, head up there in October. We switch weekends because it's a little better weather. Um, we also are hoping that uh, the Patriots and the and the well the Red Sox may not still be playing. I'm an Orioles fan. We'll leave it there. Um, but uh, we're, ex we're excited to get up because we're also excited to have Alex join us uh, for uh, all for a big Saturday morning. So we've uh, we're going to hand it over to him, and uh, uh, we'll try not to uh, uh, ask too many uh, questions in front of the group because uh, <laughs> all the historians are excited that we got you to uh, come out. So we're really appreciative of that as well, and. Um, you were talking about the Torrigan at um at Bunker Hill. Um, I went to Fort Ticonderoga as a kid and got the tri corner hat, so I definitely can uh, relate there. But excellent. Um, so as we wrap up, uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, joining us thank on you this very much. Rev War Reverie. Um, we will be back in two weeks, folks, and this time we're actually headed south to another for with another author, Bert Dunkerley, who'll be doing uh talking about the Battle of Morse Creek, so King George and Broadsword, so militia again uh, in that accent. So um. Pay attention to buy emergingrevolutionarywar.org. If you, and we know we said it a few times, if you want those tickets to left to join us, um, also head over to Historic Nerdery. We'll uh, link that on the blog as well. And uh, also make sure you uh, get a copy of Alex's book uh, so you can be prepared for October so you can try to stump the uh, historian on Lexington Green. So uh, with that, definitely will be a quiz. Quiz, there we go. Uh, and uh, there's also, uh, I mean, there's, probably a tavern somewhere where we can uh, debate um, this as well. But uh, history and beer go together. Um, but Absolutely. before we go down that rabbit hole, thank you again, Alex, for joining us. Everyone thank you so have much. Have a great rest of your Sunday night. And we will see you back here in two weeks on Rev War Revory.